Um, they had the trailer for Spider-Man, which was kind of cryptic. It could be more cryptic. It could it could be a blurry camera that zooms out while some soft God music plays, it. and it's a it's a beer bottle on a, on a on a coffee table next to an obituary for for Mary Jane. And as it keeps pulling out, you see a Spider-Man costume draped over a couch, and then you just hear sobbing in the background. That'd be cryptic. Yeah, it would. Do spiders eat worms? <laughs> that could have been an interesting solution to this movie we were supposed to be watching. Hey, I'm Joe. I'm Ken. I'm Joe. I'm Dan. And we're the Rewinders what? Podcast, rewinding movies to see if Joe holds up. And this time... We Joed all over. You know, this would Joe's. be funny if we had Joe's. watched, you know, meet Joe How about Dirt? those sand Joes? God. Or Joe versus, or Joe versus the Volcano. Ooh, Joe Dangerous. versus the yeah. Volcano. Yeah. Um, now I just want coffee. No, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about Trumbo. I think this is one of uh, Brian Cranston's better roles, so I'm really, really pumped to talk about it. I, I have the book. I just, I haven't read the book before watching the movie. Because I'm confused. What movie was I supposed to watch yesterday? Because I definitely watched Tremors. I watched Trumbo, Tremors. Trumbo, right? Kevin Trumbo? Bacon. The History God. of Trempolo County, Wisconsin. Dang it! That is not the movie I watched. Is it that really a county? On the Mississippi River, between Wisconsin and Minnesota, lies Trumpolo. Oh my. At the elevation of 738 feet, with an area of 2.25 miles squared. This little burg contains 1,775 people, and has a three-star hotel. Mm. Huh. It was a good that's, documentary. Uh, that's, oh. that's, that's pretty sad if the call-out for the, for the place is that it has a three-star hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. It's slightly better than those towns that I've been to with the only two-star hotels. Oof. This town is famous for its restaurant, which was rated as a dive, and not best quality by Flavor Town critic, blah, 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 Guy Fieri. Yeah, that's a great claim to fame with your three-star hotel there. Well, it would have been better than the the town of Providence, or whatever it was in the movie. Perfection. 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 Perfection in the movie Tremors. No, that town is perfection. Everything about that town is glorious. Name three things. It's it's a little it's a <laughs> okay, it's a little haven nestled in between two two sides bordered by mountains and one side bordered by a cliff. It is a geographical Okay, I'll give you one. Yeah, it is it is beautiful. It is so remote. It's two. Okay, three. You gave me. God damn it! You're right. <laughs> and and come on, come on. The town has Kevin Bacon. The town has Victor Wong. Yeah, Victor Wong. Um, had had. The town has Fred Ward. Fred Ward. It has Reba McIntyre with guns. <laughs> with guns. I'm yes! so happy they did that with this movie. <laughs> oh, so good. But yes, I I, I digress. Perfection is mwah, chef's kiss. It is perfection. Yeah. So does anyone have? a backstory to this movie any history other than it was like a a meme movie to watch in high school i've never seen tremors in its entirety up until this week whoa how was it memed in high school we would just like turn it on to have it on and make jokes about the movie that sounds like watching movies in high school in general pretty much yeah i mean it, it, that was it was before the term meme was even a thing oh god i'm old yeah <laughs> <laughs> That hurts. Dude, we're all old. It's it's sad. This is this is the second attempt to reboot Ghostbusters. I mean, we're we're old. So my history, my my sister and uh, my my brother in law were dating in high school at the time, and I remember very vividly they were talking this movie up like crazy, and I was like, oh, I want to watch it. And they said, no, it's too scary. It's it's a horror movie. You're not gonna. You're, you're too young. And I kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. I think I was like seven at the time, maybe. <laughs> And eventually I pushed enough, and my, my parents relented, and my sister relented, and my brother-in-law, we, we all watched it. And I loved this movie. I loved it to the point where, like, when fall would come around, I'd rake the leaves into a giant graboid and then lay in it. Mm. <laughs> just, like, winter would come around and make a giant graboid. Like, huh. I just, I, I love this movie. I grew up with this movie. I watched this movie quite frequently, probably at least once a year, maybe twice a year. It was very quotable around the house. 
My my sister for I, I don't even think she stopped ever doing it, but she always quoted Kevin Bacon. Shut up! <laughs> I like there's just so so many things in this movie that were quoted from my sister and my brother in law. Just it really stuck with me. So I was I was, I was excited to see this through the myopic lens of uh, of uh, <laughs> bias for for myself. So I was really excited to come back and take a look at it and see if it was nostalgia just holding it up or if it was a good movie. I guess we'll get into the answer to that question later. <laughs> yes, yes. How about you, Ken? Let me tell you, I have some interesting history with this movie. I never wanted to watch it. And then I got on a <laughs> podcast once about movies and uh, they kept on talking about this mo- this, this Tremors movie a lot. And like, I believe, no, I think we talked about it on this, either on this show or like before or after or sometime around. And so I've only recently ever decided to watch this movie. And so I'm, I'm fairly new to it. And honestly, it's, yeah, we'll get into it. But yeah, it's, I shouldn't have waited. <laughs> and I didn't start watching this till sometime in high school, but I didn't really pay attention to it because it, it didn't really grab my attention at that time. Yeah, it was cool <sighs> with sand, sandworms and stuff like that but the graboids didn't grab you they didn't i i really was more interested in screwing around with my friends than watching this movie fair fair Fair. i had watched it on and i'll put air quotes around watched it a few times and just was like i don't remember a lot about it i remember your basics so it was a like a refresher for me and going ah i get to look at this from almost 30 years later (laughs) Something like that. <laughs> Not 30. Okay, God, that's a little too much. But uh, either way. This is one of those movies that, like I said, we, we had it on VHS. I watched the living crap out of it as a kid. And then once I moved out on my own as a, as a fresh-eyed adult, um, I just I, I didn't watch it anymore. I, I didn't own it. I didn't have a VHS player. So it's just like it, it was always one of those movies I remembered fondly, but I just never had a chance to watch. But then I eventually did buy the Blu-ray back in, I think, 2014 or 15. So that was the first time I got to watch it again, and I loved it just as much as the first time, you know, it was great going back to it, so. I I tried to make it a point to watch it every year, but it fell off the rails again, so this is the first time coming back to it to watch it in probably about, at least four years or so. It was a good refresher. Well, for those of you who have not seen the movie Tremors from 1990... Here's a quick summation. We got two guys that do everything around town but want to leave town. Town is really small and, as said before, snuggled between mountains and a cliff. And there's only one road in or out. So it makes it perfect for a murder mystery, but that's not what we get here. We get sandworms. (laughs) I would almost argue it is a murder mystery. I I love the way this movie flips that, like horror film like slasher on its head like I, I just i just love the way they do that and then we follow the plucky crew of the two guys that just want to get out of town who now cannot get out of town as they try to survive with the very few inhabitants of this very remote community and the community has to come together because if on their own they'd never survive and together they survive the sandworms that eat Probably half the community. Yeah, it's a half. Sure. Easily half the community. And and it really shows how much they care about the community since Val and Earl came back at least twice. I think three times. They had three separate occasions maybe where they could have left town, but they kept coming back. Cool. So let's let's just dive right into this because that's what people say in every single goddamn video on YouTube and podcast or dissect it Ooh. it's either dive or dissect he's not wrong <laughs> i'd prefer to dive dissect is way too in- involved or let's jump on jump on into this let's plunge in let's stamp the ground and chuck some homemade pipe bombs on this uh, whoa. let's pull vault our way into some opinions <laughs> coordinated pole vaulting at that yes okay so things we like i like the premise of this movie right it's so good it's a good premise it's something different yes like sci-fi horror films are usually pretty cookie cutter Mm -hmm. i say that and then i look at some of the like trailers for the subsequent films in this series we just need to ignore and it starts to hurt (laughs) After the second one, and then there's extreme pain after the fifth. Oh, 
Oh yes, oh yes. For, for those who aren't aware, the original Tremors is phenomenal. And then after the original Tremors, this series goes so batshit crazy off the rails, I haven't seen anything like stumble over itself as hard as this series <laughs> It's interesting the route that they took it in, but my god. It's just, if you're looking to find more of the first movie in, in the sequels, outside of Fred Ward being in the sequel, the second one, uh, or Bert being in every one, that's, there's not much else to look okay, forward to. Okay, but as somebody who just watched Halloween 3, mm. I may have to cordially disagree with you on taking the biggest swing. Season of the Witch? Well, Correct. What? That was at least planned. I that was at least planned. John one. Carpenter always envisioned it as a... Um, uh, what word am I thinking of? Like, brain fart just took over my entire mind. You know, like, Tales of the Crypt and things like that. Um, like cereal? Creep show. Yeah, yeah cereal. not cereal, but, but along those lines. Essentially, where every single version was going to be a different story. I, I, there's a word, I just can't remember off the top of my head. It just, it just farted out of my mind, but he was always planning on it to be that. Like a monster of the week? Yeah, like every Halloween movie was going to be different. But, after the success of the original, the studios pressured him into doing another Michael Myers movie, so he did a second Michael Myers movie, but then finally after Michael Myers in the second one, he's like, all right, I did your thing. Now, damn it, let me have my third movie. And that's why we got Season of the Witch. Because it was always supposed to be a different scary story with every single Halloween movie. But Michael Myers was so wildly popular and it was so unlike anything at the time because it was just this nonstop, um, unstoppable killing machine that had no motive whatsoever. And everybody's like, holy crap, that's amazing. He has no backstory, he has no reason, he just kills. And it was, it was terrifying, everybody loved him, and they didn't want to see that go. So that's kind of why that series continued with that. It was never intended to be that way, so 3 was actually intended. So Season of the Witch, with all its goofiness, was actually meant to be. I like it. I love that movie for what it is. Huh. I, love I, it. I thoroughly enjoyed watching the movie. <laughs> and uh, Mindless Killing Machine for No Reason also is exactly what happened in that movie. <laughs> However, it's definitely... a detraction from what the movie is yeah no for sure for sure uh other things we like <laughs> for me effects oh i thought you're gonna go i thought the first thing you're gonna go to was uh casting namely shared cast with another great movie from the time jurassic park oh there is some cross adriana richards uh i don't know her name uh lexi in jurassic park yeah adriana adriana richards i was uh i, I was watching it this time around at, i watched uh jurassic park recently as well i was like wait a minute holy crap it is her it's only four years apart it is adriana richards yes absolutely that was one of the first things i caught too when i was a kid it's like wait is that lex and sure enough so seeing her again in this it's like it, it's such a time war for me because those two movies are so important to me jurassic park and tremors they just came around at like this time when i was a child malleable with monster movies and it's just like what more could you possibly want from giant killer sandworms and kevin bacon and then dinosaurs three years later it's just like oh it's it puts me in a happy spot going back to this point in time but yeah no the, the casting not even just it, adriana richards but just the casting in general i feel it was extremely strong in this film. absolutely everyone played the part everybody perfectly. was just shining absolutely absolutely i mean victor wong was a little over the top in some parts but i mean other, other than that it was it was fantastic you don't say nothing bad about Victor Wong. <laughs> <laughs> what he gives what he gives Melvin the stink guy. <laughs> I think it was a great blend in casting of people that let's say like a Kevin Bacon who is pretty mm -hmm. and then you have your other actors that are like people who blend in with the normies like us. You know, it kind of like gave a blend of an actual community. Yeah, it was great. Like a, like a good mix of, uh, you know, you got Nestor and Miguel and everyone else like that. Mm -hmm. You have some kids in the mix too with Melvin and, and Mindy. It's it, it's a good mix of characters, good mix of ethnicities. It's a really, really good ensemble cast. I, I thoroughly enjoy the casting in this film. I'm actually wondering how they ended up getting so many big names in this movie. Like, were they planning on this being, was this released as a blockbuster movie or was it? I, I, I think you're know. overestimating how famous these people were at that time. Uh, I very well could be i'm not very uh versed I, I guess that was a fairly young kevin bacon yes 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 extremely young kevin bacon he was a known quantity but he wasn't a blockbuster name uh had he taught a neighborhood uh a, a, a town how to dance yet <laughs> Yes, he had. Yes, yes, so he had. So maybe he had already yes. signed up for this movie beforehand because it doesn't seem... Well, 
who am I to say? This seems like a, this was a fun, it was probably a really fun movie to record and probably the reason why a lot of people were there. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only imagine the conversation with Reba McIntyre. Like, hey, this is your character. She's a gun nut. You and this other guy are just going to stand in a room and fire every gun on a wall at this thing. And she probably just cracked a smile. Said, Absolutely. <laughs> How could you not want to be in that role? <laughs> I want to be I in mean, that I mean, at the role. same time, she was doing a TV series... I think I think Rebo was probably yeah. running around the same time. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't know when this movie was made. I've I've never paid attention to the release. So when I when I saw it was 1990, I was actually taken by surprise because to be honest, after watching it again, it doesn't even feel dated to the point where it feels like it's from the 90s. Outside the fact, you know, some maybe maybe fashion vehicles and, and no cell phones, you can't really pick this at a time. Melvin it, it is very feel. 90s. Melvin is very 90s. I will give you that. I will give you that. But for me, it hasn't aged too badly. The, there was only one real scene, special effects-wise, that was even remotely bad. It was when they were firing in the basement, and there was the one single frame where Bert's got, uh, I think it was the elephant gun at the time, where he's lining up the first shot, and you can clearly see the outline because it's a mat. But then everything after that was same room and perfectly fine, so I don't know why that was a mat. But all the special effects, I thought, really held up in this movie. Like, really, really well. That's what happens when you use practical effects. That it holds up. I know! Imagine that! Practical effects for 90%, and then you fill in the 10% with CGI to make the things you can't do with practical effects work, or as garnishing. That's how you do a movie. Garnish. Yep. You don't just cheap out and do... Uh, uh, but I digress. The 90s were the last bastion of unfiltered cgi garbage uh, eh, there are still some practical effects out there even the new star wars movies are making big set pieces and such like if you're saying the animatronics look fake as shit well yeah so does your cgi don't get so high up on your horse mm -hmm. there because otherwise the graboid's gonna come out and chase your horses away yeah exactly or, or swallow you up in your station wagon. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> that scene stuck with me as a kid. I'm not sure why, but that was such a good scene. It still is. And when they go and find the thing, they're like wiping off the... Uh, the grill and the headlights, yeah. And then they uh, page out and you just see the he headlight beams going up into the air. It's so cool. It's such a good scene. I, I think that's one of my favorite things about this film is it really flips that whole like slasher film mentality of the late 80s and early 90s on its head because... It starts off that way where they think, you know, somebody's just going around murdering people and it, it really feels like that. But you don't know that the threat is even bigger than that. You don't know that the threat is something you can't even physically see. So it just keeps careening into this bigger and bigger and bigger thing until eventually shit's coming out of the ground and killing people. <laughs> it's so well done and it's, I, I love that it careens into that, that avenue as well too, that it's nowhere's really safe. So like all the all the staple horror film things, quick, get in the car. Oh no, there's no key. It's okay, I'll just sit in the car because you can't get me here. Car gets swallowed in the ground. Yeah. Oh my god, the thing's chasing us. Get in the building. The building's safe. Nope, it's underground. Foundation's garbage. It's going to trash the building. Like, it's we didn't just... pour concrete foundations. Why didn't we pour concrete <laughs> foundations? Cinder blocks everywhere. You don't need foundations <laughs> in places where there aren't tornadoes. You don't need basements. You True, need a foundation. Unless you're, unless you're Bert. Especially in the sand. Sand's shifting. And you get a slab and that's it. Well, if you're Bert and Heather, you, you plan for nuclear war, so then you have you a basement. Cinder blocks. They have basements, which is freaking awesome. You gotta have some place to store our guns <laughs> that can be semi-climate controlled and not filled with dust. <laughs> but apparently these buildings just use uh, footers on the corners and so just put a truss up overneath those. Uh, overneath, <laughs> over, just over. That they don't nail down the floorboards for the for the porch. <laughs> <laughs> for the store or anything like that. Or maybe that's just how strong the Graboid uh, is. Doesn't look like they got tons of money to throw around. That's fair. They're, they're hiring two local handymen to go around and do literally whatever they, they want money for. Pump crap out of a sewer? Sure. <laughs> go put up a, a barbed wire fence? Sure. And you get I mean, the idea that there might be some traffic coming through there, because it's like, it's a valley with a road, so like they set up shop there for a reason. Yeah. However, you never are going to know how busy uh, this town is, because the road's blocked. Which is a great way to keep, uh, one, your characters in town, and two, production costs to a minimum. Why is there no uh, traffic going around yet? Yeah, because no one's allowed in. Yeah, it, and that just lends a hand to it, too. It's not like your typical horror film. It's not like, you know, the police show up or anything like that. There are no cops. They'd have to come from the adjacent city, and that just really adds another layer to the horror, is that you're isolated on all fronts. You will die in this town. <laughs> like that really lends a hand to the community kind of coming together and having to tackle the, f the threat on their own because they really they do have to come together or they'll all die <laughs> there's so many things pushing this movie and that's what i like about it 
there's just so many things that y- you can't take for granted from other horror movies or other other survival tactics because it's just like it just keeps saying like haha well that would normally work but what about this I mean, what other movies do you have I mean other than Deep Blue Sea spoilers for that but what other movies do you have where the main characters are just standing around all of a sudden the floor just opens up below him and he's, he's devoured in front of everyone <laughs> like this, you're not safe you're not safe in this movie it's great it's either going to be aliens or um, mm. another one in that series where everyone's around in a group and then a uh, xenomorph pops out of a air vent or something and just kills somebody and then disappears true i do take that back i can't believe i didn't think of that there's good horror for sure and i i don't want to poo poo slasher flicks because there's a lot of fun to have with those it's just it, there was definitely a mold that was followed in the mid 80s to I, mean, I, I guess even the, like late seventies into the to the late eighties, I guess somewhere in that tam- time frame, there was definitely a formula. Sure, <laughs> it, it stayed that way for yeah, a little while. You know me, I love a good flasher, uh, slasher. I love a bad flash slasher <laughs> even better. <laughs> <laughs> a bad flasher. It's a lot of Freudian slips. I was in just there. thinking chopping mall just now. <laughs> yeah, this is a different uh, quality where it, it, it takes the uh, the suspense up to a different level by trying to uh, hide things on, on you and make you guess and work to th- work to it versus just you know the big lumbering thing. Like yeah, it still is a big lumbering thing in it. Under the ground with big old spikes. But one of them is smart. Oh right, there's yes. four big lumbering things. Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, I, I think one of my favorite aspects of this is the fact that you start the film off thinking that it's just these... Okay, so something's killing something. What is that? Cool, now we figured out what it is because it's wrapped around the axle of the truck. It's these weird eel things that go underground. Not even to the halfway mm-hmm. point of the movie. Not even close. Exactly. You get to the halfway point of the movie or later, whenever they're riding out on horseback. That I feel like that's past the halfway point. And that's when you really get your first look at what the scope of the movie is when you first see a graboid it's like oh holy crap that's what they're up against this is just like a thing from the thing but then on top of that it ramps up even more when you get the seismologist saying there's four of them it's like it it just keeps building on itself and and this threat just keeps getting more and more menacing as the film goes on which i really like how the film does did that like there's the exposition train that they might be trying uh trapped into where she's like Oh, this is what happens, and yada yada, and tries she tries to go into a spiel about what's going on, but the audience is already there with everyone else, and Kevin Bacon doesn't necessarily understand as his character doesn't necessarily understand. He just understands there's four, so he's like, "Yeah, hey, don't just it doesn't matter. <laughs> Got it? There's four of them. I don't need to understand yeah. this bit." <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the way the film frames it too, because not even once up until that point has the audience been exposed to anything that they think this would be a bigger threat. So, like, we are right there with the cast, learning as they learn. So it's like, oh, cool, there's eels. Oh, cool, Fred Ward just said, or not Fred Ward, Kevin Bacon said, there must be a million of them when when the ground's popping up underneath them. That's what we're thinking, too. But then all of a sudden, a giant-ass worm comes out with just that thing on the tip, and it's just like, okay, we're all learning as an audience at the same time that the cast is learning that the threat is much bigger than they thought it was. (laughs) There's no like lumbering shadows in the background of a of a of a suited killer or, or us getting a sneak peek of what's really there before the characters do. I, I liked how they did that. The pacing for that was great. Who the hell directed this? I want to know now. Ron Underwood. What else have you done, good sir? Tremors five, six, seven. Oh, okay, okay. It's it looks like a very tumultuous uh, history. <laughs> you got Tremors as the second movie. Then you got City oh. Slickers. <laughs> then you got Heart and Souls. Then you got Speechless. Then you got Mighty Joe Young. <laughs> Then you've got the adventures of Pluto Nash. The one thing that gets me all happy about watching movies from the 80s and 90s is when they got Uzis in them. I knew you were going to say that. Yep. And this one has a license plate. Uzi for you. This one has a license plate for an Uzi. I thought you were going to go nuts over that. Uzi for you. (laughs) Yeah. Got to Go big on the Uzi or go home. Even people who, like, weren't, like, massive fans of this movie that I knew through school, even people who, like, never watched it more than once, everyone knew of that damn scene with with Bert and Heather. Mm -hmm. That was, like, the most legendary scene. Everybody knew about it. Everybody talked about it. Everybody laughed about it. It was this amazing thing, just this wall of freaking guns and them going insane with them. It's just, ah, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. And yes, the, the the Uzi for you, the Uzis, and just there's there's so much to love with the the weaponry in this movie. <laughs> I do like they take 
people that are being framed as gun nuts and preppers and <laughs> treats them with the same dignity that they treat all the other people people in town. Yes, yes. And then you get that you get that funniest I love the way the comedy works in this movie too because then you get that funniest hell line from Bert after they kill the one graboid. He's like I guess we can't make fun of their lifestyle anymore, can we? <laughs> Does it work? God damn it. Yeah. But I mean that falls into what was what I said earlier in like the summation is that this is a great movie for preaching community mm-hmm. that an individual themselves can only be so strong, can only be so smart, can only do so much. But when we work together in a community that you can achieve so much more. Oh, for sure. There's there's so many little pockets in this movie. Where a character has an idea, but then another character around that character has a better idea, and they go with that idea instead after thinking about it. And there's several scenes as well, too, where Kevin Bacon asks, uh, or Val, <laughs> uh, okay, I, I need names, and it's gonna drive me nuts if I don't have names. When, when Val asks Rhonda what, what they should do next, and she asks him, like, point blank back, why do you keep asking me? <laughs> it's just like... There's, there's so many little pockets of that where, where characters are relying on each other for the next cue versus just some macho plan or some, some crazy batshit plan that's going to work just because, you know, plot armor. It's actually a community coming up with ideas. You got Miguel thinking about the lawnmower. Val and Earl thinking about the bulldozer and how to get that out of there. And, you know, it's, it's Earl's idea to get the semi-trailer as well, too. Like, you know, Val knows about it, but it's got flat tires, but Earl sees it as a, a valid solution. It's just that constant building of everybody in contributing to different ideas on how to do everything. It's 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 very community centered, like you said. It's 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 a really 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 good example of that. Yeah, it's nice not having one person being like the superhero. I can figure everything out. Uh, thing. It's nice to have a community of perhaps bumbling people, but still trying their best to get out of it and actually being fairly successful at it yeah. too. You don't yeah. get the feeling they're the smartest people on the block, but hey, they did it. Exactly. They all have ideas and they all are contributing. Taking kind of that notion of like, this is the character to follow because they know what's going on. They have an idea. This is more of a community sense where everybody's lending ideas to try to push the team forward. Whereas Alien, it was more so just like, hey, that thing that you're used to where this is the action star. Yeah, there's no action star. It's just a normal person that's going to get out of this one. So I, I respect those movies and those, those choices so, so deeply for that. There's a time and a place, but not every movie can have that. I also felt that Tremors did a very good job with setups and payouts. (laughs) Yeah, Stampede is like the the long-baked joke of the whole damn movie. (laughs) You get that at the beginning, and you get that at the very tail end. But it might be the lighter. (laughs) Oh, for sure, for sure, yes. Because the lighter is the first real prop. That gets mm-hmm. used, and there's a whole yep. Who's got who's got the lighter? And that goes through the entire movie. And I didn't realize it till I watched it the second time. Oh my god, you're right because they're always smoking throughout the movie, and they're always flip flopping who has the lighter because they're passing the pack of cigarettes between each other. Mm-hmm. That is incredible. I didn't even see that. Oh man. Oh, I love details like that. Love it. I also like that all the people who tripped when they were running, for the most part, didn't die because they tripped. Yes, you expect them to, but it did not go that cliche angle. (laughs) But a lot of people trip in this movie, and it got really annoying to me by the end. I'm like, yeah, okay, you've done this (laughs) multiple times. Let's move on. Joe, have you ever tried running through the sand? It's real tough. Have have you ever tried laying on the ground wrapped in barbed wire? Oh, I just take my clothes off. Apparently that works. <laughs> I, I think the most stress-inducing scene for me as a child was uh, hands down Kevin Bacon stuck like 10 feet from the tractor, uh, from the bulldozer, and having to keep lifting his boot and moving it as that one eel head just keeps yeah. sliding back and forth. That was just panic-inducing as a child. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> And to go along with that, when they did Foley for this movie, if you pay attention, the Foley to this movie is louder than Foley in other movies because you become very aware of everyone's footsteps, everyone's, like, if they move something, if they shift around, so the noise they make gets uh, turned up a little bit. And I'm gonna guess that's probably been done in plenty of other movies, but it it stood out to me after a while because I just was like, why Why are they amped up on those footsteps? And also I'm like, oh, that's right, because that's the creature hearing it. 
so they amped yeah. it up so that we, the viewer, could hear it so we understand why. Yeah, no, that's a good call out as well. If I remember correctly, the uh, production for A Quiet Place took their cues Oh, from yeah. huh. bits and pieces of tremor. Oh, really? Or tremors? <laughs> yeah. If I, I'd have to, I'd have to see if I could find the article on it again. Oh, that's awesome. If that's it would the make case. sense. I would, ass- like, I was going to say, I assume that movie does the same thing because it's all about sound. It's if you like, have you not seen Quiet Place, Joe? No, I have not. Oh. It's on Netflix. You need to watch it. I, need I, to. I have I a it. good twenty movies that I probably need to watch. Okay, you should make it twenty one. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> you should make it 21, watch this movie, and then make it 20 again. Like, right yeah, away. I'm not going to go that far. I got things to do today. It's, <laughs> it's worth a watch when you get around to it. Here's an, amazing, here's an amazing piece of trivia. Did you guys realize that Kevin Bacon has said that Tremors is the only film of his that he's actually rewatched? Oh, wow. He has a soft spot for this film. <laughs> it's because of the hair. He wishes he had that hair again. <laughs> yeah. It's a good movie. There's a lot of stuff going in on it that... It definitely makes it a rewatchable movie. I'm going to say after watching it the second time, the movie, like the first time I watched it, it felt like the movie took longer to get through plot points. Oh, for sure. When I watched it the second time, it just started like moving along at a clip that I didn't notice the first time that I was watching it. Yeah, it's, it's like the second time you watch it, the, the doctor's death comes up a lot faster, things like that. And then, and then you know, to the point where they're riding on the horseback to go to the next town. It's like, that all comes up pretty quick. It's, it's all that exposition up to that point is pretty slow the first time you watch it it feels like it's a whole nother movie at that point because there's just so much that happens so i timed it out it's around 20 minutes between them introducing you to the characters to the city till people start dying that's so nice i i was like because i was feeling the same thing i'm like are is this just gonna keep dicking around with exposition or is it gonna get to the point point? and then right at that 20 minute mark it's mark it's like nope time to go this is it Things are moving. So yep. it's comparable to other movies we've watched where around the 20 minute mark, that's where everything starts happening. I, I got to throw in a comment that the only thing that did terrify me as a child and like really rattled me as a child was definitely the, the shepherd's head under his hat. That scared the shit out of me as a kid. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> that got Katie when we watched it the second time. Yup. <laughs> I was watching the doctor's mouth as he was getting pulled under the the dirt and sand because I was like, wow, his mouth is really close to that dirt and sand. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. He's committed to that. And then when Victor Wong gets dragged down by one of the uh, graboids, there's a foot way up in the air. And I'm like, God, I hope that's not his real foot because... <laughs> That would have hurt. <laughs> I'm sure he's fine. Nothing wrong with a little bit of a stretch. Uh so I I'm gonna I'm gonna say Victor Wong is not fine. What? <laughs> I mean he's very dead. Oh, yeah, he's, I didn't know that. He's he's been gone a while, I think. Dude. The day after 9-11. Did the graboids get him? Holy shit. Are the graboids are, no, that's not a joke about What a what a hell of a day to go. That, that being the last thing he sees. But yeah, hats off to that man. I loved him in so many different roles. Oh, I, I freaking love him in Big Trouble in Little China. Absolutely love him in that movie. But yeah. Not to not to bring everything down suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> a curtain has fallen on all of us. <laughs> But yeah, no, um, I, yeah, I feel like we could sit here and talk all day about the good things about the movie because there's just so much to dissect. There's, there's, there's comedy, there's horror, there's good pacing, there's good cinematography, good shots, good special effects, like all kinds of crap to talk about. But there are some detractors for sure, and that's definitely where we can go next. Yeah. Um, no matter how many times I watch this, I can't believe how quickly Melvin rebounds that his dad died. Like, it's, it's like he's, he's mortified when it first happens, when he's shouting, you guys gotta do something, and it's heartbreaking, because the, the crack in his voice and everything, he's just a kid. And watching everybody on the roof, just watching, knowing that there's nothing they can do. But then, like, legitimately the next scene, they're trying to figure out how to make a distraction, and... <laughs> And uh, Earl says, hey, Melvin, you want to make five bucks or, or whatever he says? And, and he just flips him off with the middle finger and then makes that like leering voice. It's like, I, I don't think he'd be in that mental state after his dad just got dragged under the ground and killed. I, I don't know. That's that's a, that's a real big nitpick on my part. No, I see it. I see it. Like, I guess that's, I, I, it never occurred to me because I hate Melvin's character. 
<laughs> Melvin was that character. I really would have preferred. I really, really preferred he had died. Yup, he's that character you want to reach to the screen and punch, that's for sure. It's the most comparable character I have to um, Eddie Furlong's character in Terminator 2. Ah. Ex- except mm. Eddie Furlong's character ruined Terminator 2 for me, and it's unrecoverable. Uh, Melvin is just annoying, but luckily he's not the main character, so he doesn't ruin the movie <laughs> for me. Your, your, your documented uh, disjoy of Mr. Furlong is, is well noted. <laughs> It's not his fault. <laughs> he probably could have done better. So many kids grew up wishing they were him. <laughs> you grew up hating him with a passion. It's a, it's a very strange fence that we all lived on. Other sides of. <laughs> I will give... This is in the negative car- uh, category, but I will give the character Rhonda tons of credit for being able to dive into a truck, use her hands to push on the gas pedal, and yet still yes. steer the truck to stay on the road. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Talent. That's what that PhD does for you. <laughs> Which doctor school do you need to go to learn how to do that? Uh, uh, geology, apparently. <laughs> Looks like I'm taking some night classes. That's geology school. <laughs> you never know when you're gonna need to know how to do that. She was a she was going for geology, right? Uh, yeah, geology. I, I forgot to mention this in the happy happy section, but this movie passes the Bechdel test with flying colors. Oh, in it. I'll agree with that. Yeah, there are plenty of women talking to women, then they don't talk about men. Yes, they talk about guns. <laughs> they talk about what guns to take, what ammo to take. If there's any, any ammo that's better than the ammo you're using. <laughs> or, or they talk about cooking a fine meal to do some work. <laughs> so I'm actually honestly right now thinking about all the ladies talking to ladies in this movie. And I don't think there's much lady to lady conversation even though. There's there's some conversation between, um, uh, what is it? There's some conversation between Mindy and her mom. There's conversation between uh, Mindy and, or, or not Mindy and... Uh, Ah, oh, names, names. It's like the names are there, but they're just not coming out for some reason. Um, Heather. <laughs> to be honest, though, the sex or gender of the characters doesn't really come into play in this whole movie. It doesn't. You have a girl rip her pants off to get away from something, and it doesn't feel sexualized. It just feels like it was necessary for her to get away. It, it's not like, it's not like the awkwardness of Alien, where she just strips down to nothing but her panties and. I'm gonna I'm gonna go against you there a little bit because, eh, yeah, she puts she puts pants back on fairly quick, so it's not like she spends the rest of her, the movie without pants. But fairly quick. Like the next scene, she's wearing pants. They gi- they give her a pair of jeans and and shoes, and she has them on like well. The grab boy is killing. But they still take plenty Mr. of time Wong. to get close ups of her legs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not a lot, but it is a small injection of sex into this movie. And I'll give you that. It's a weird thing to say that a lady's legs with underwear is considered sex, but again... But they're all bloody in the next scene, Joe. Out of nowhere. What do you mean out of nowhere? It's a barbed wire. No, barbed wire. I understand. Barbed wire. <laughs> the barbed wire was around her shins, not up her thighs. Uh, barbed anyway. wire. <laughs> I thought it got that high. It just it's a tad of an excuse to make a character slightly more sexy and then quickly cover it up and move on, which to the credit of the movie did not linger on sexy college ed education legs. <laughs> what? Do from All right. what I've seen. What? Alright, let me And it's bad. Oh, you got quiet, Roth. Yeah, start okay, over. You guys hear me still? Yeah. Let me paint a picture for you. It's nineteen ninety. Studio executives hear about this giant sandworm movie, and they're like, what the hell? We we already did one of those. Dune didn't do so well. Why are we doing this again? And they're like, no! And they explain the plot, and everything goes well. But then they were wondering, as they sit around smoking their cigars and, and fondling their, their, their pants, where, where are the boobs? <laughs> and then, and then the, the brilliant idea comes along of, the Tremors can't see you if you're naked. If you're naked, they can't, they can't, they can't sense you. Uh... Like dinosaurs. So everybody just has to strip down naked and run around naked. It could have been worse. It could have oh, been a yeah, lot yeah, yeah. worse. Yeah. I mean, I think it feels like there's there's less 
producing to this movie than some others. There's no open boobs in this movie at all. Yes. There's no just random shots of a bra going over as somebody gets dressed. There's no random shots of like somebody's wet so haha we have to have pokies and yeah. things like that. Like there's nothing salacious like that. Or or Melvin finding a magazine that his father had, you know, like s- staples. Yeah, yeah. And and lingering on the cover of the centerfold. It's just like no. <laughs> So I, I agree and disagree. Like, I, I can understand that side, but at the same point, it's like, I, I feel like this is one of the more refreshing films I've seen that did not have a, a crazy amount of over-the-top nudity for no reason. I mean, even The Naked Gun. The Naked Gun is a comedy, and it's such a good comedy that kids can pretty much watch it because it's goofy, it's slapstick. Yet, there's the scene where he's out on the ledge, walking around the outside the apartment complex, and the lady's completely bare-chested in front of the window. Airplane. Airplane is super goofy. Airplane is a great movie that everybody gets introduced to at a younger age. That has boobs. It has random women just running up and down the the aisle of the airplane with their tops off for no reason. There's so many films where it's just, it's not necessary and it's just there for, I don't know why... Somebody had their say, some producer got their day, but I'm, 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 I'm genuinely shocked that this didn't have anything. No, I'm, I'm with you. It is not bad, but it's, it's the whole, that's the thing. <laughs> it's legs. Legs with tidy whities yeah. That's the sex <laughs> of the movie. Don't forget Val's table of necessities for the perfect woman. Oh yes, as, as they're approaching and he's like, she's going to have long blonde hair, she's going to have world-class boobs, legs that don't end. Ass that doesn't quit, legs that go all the way up, and something else. There's five points. And he doesn't get it, so. It, it, it turns him on his head right away. Mm-hmm. It's like, this isn't anything you just said. And then the rest of the movie proves that that's It just stupid. doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Because in the movie Speed, we all learn that stressful situations can lead to bad relationships. So we just watched a bad relationship flourish. <laughs> they can also lead to pop quizzes. <laughs> that's that's all I thought about at the end. Or the awkwardness of uh, Deckard's kiss in Blade Runner. Oh, I still no, that's I even, love that movie so much. That kiss is <laughs> so much worse. That's something else. It honestly is. It honestly is. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Forced action movie kisses, where it's just like we survived this thing together. I'm I'm a smoocha. <laughs> It feels unnatural, it feels unwanted. And plus, the cowboy hat. He knew how to kiss with a cowboy hat on. He's got more practice mm-hmm. than he admits. They didn't swear a lot in this movie. No, that's that's another great detail. Some characters did, some characters didn't. They put the per- the requisite one fuck. Yeah, Kevin Bacon. In the PG-13 movie. And after that, like, the swearing died down. It was still sprinkled throughout, but like... If, if you noticed, like Earl said, when they first came across, uh, oh, what's his name? Edgar. When they first came across Edgar up on the, the power power tower, he said, get your stinking butt down here or whatever. And then Kevin Bacon's climbing it and starts talking to himself and talking about how he's got to come down or come up there and drag his sorry ass down. It's like the characters had personality and the characters had a certain way of talking. Earl maybe swore once, I think, twice. Kevin Bacon swore a bunch of times in the movie. It's it's just like the characters were very well written to the point where they actually mimicked real life people. Not everybody swears. Not everybody sits there and just screams F-bombs constantly. Everybody talks differently. But yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of swearing in the movie. That's for sure. That was... Pretty crazy. Because I think even, doesn't Bert say you broke into the wrong Galdarn rec room or something like that? I'd have to go, I, I, yeah, he doesn't swear. I don't think he, I don't think he got damned. He's just Galdarn. <laughs> something along those lines. I mean, Earl did swear, I guess. He said, damn it, listen to me, I'm older and I'm wiser. Well, that was important. <laughs> it was. Unless you're someone like me, I don't, I don't consider damn it to be a swear or damn. I don't, I don't either. I don't either. Same with hell. But it looks like, it looks like Bert did say broke into the wrong goddamn rec room. So there's there's that, but... <laughs> oh, okay. So, after watching it now as compared to then, does the film hold up over time? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, for sure. <laughs> More than I expected it to. Like I said in the chat, after watching it the first time, I forgot how good of a it's movie so good. Tremors <laughs> yes. is. It's so much better than it has any right to be. Like, this is one of those movies on script, on paper, that just sounds like it's just a beat movie schlock, but it's so damn good. And yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking watching this movie. Like, this feels like a B movie. This feels like a movie that wouldn't have a Kevin Bacon, Reba McIntyre, and all these names that you just instantly recognize, but it, they turn a Absolutely. movie that could be something into a movie that really is something. Yeah, I, I gotta say, this casting was like lightning in a bottle. They had... 
a great cast for this film. My takeaway is I still like B movie. It yes, it's B movie, but yeah. it, it has <laughs> good structure, and that structure makes up for any deficiencies that the movie may have. And we'll say the practical effects, not a problem. Those are that's a huge benefit. Mm-hmm. It's shot on location. I don't know how many sets were Yes, actual sunlight. Those places might have been built like to be destroyed, to be used as sets. And, and the best part about that is the movie oozes low budget, but it doesn't feel low budget. Correct, yes. Good sound design. And that, that was something I was going to check up check up on what is what was the budget i think it was like 10 mil something along those lines they had to pay a good penny for those worms that surfaced and had pretty good articulation to the uh tendrils absolutely i I would love to know who did the special effects for that yep 10 million nice hot dang and they grossed 16 million almost 17 million win oh no the movie's also known as land sharks that's not a good name boo (laughs) Well, don't worry about that. Who knows it as land sharks apart from some weirdo on the internet? Where's that come from? Dungeons and Dragons? Saturday Night mm. Live. But land sharks? I mean, no, specifically this movie. Well, yeah, <laughs> land sharks. They don't necessarily give any in- indication <laughs> that this movie would be land sharks. Yeah, no. Oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, so four word productions did the miniature effects. Amalgamated dynamics did the creature effects. Fantasy two film effects did the visual effects. Illusion Arts did the matte paintings. And then International Special Effects and MB Special Effects Inc. did other things. But here's yours, Joe. Meridian Studios did the full week. Hey, good job, guys. Actually, good job to everyone. There's only like one or two mats that I thought looked, you know, stand out. Everything else worked pretty good. I I think, hands down, it stands up today, and I'd recommend this movie today. I mean, even music, it's it's not dated because it doesn't feature like an 80s soundtrack or 90s soundtrack. The music is just like twangy, out west, twangy, goofy town music it's like i mean sprinkled in with a little reba mcintyre yeah like she's the opening and closing (laughs) yeah themes you gotta have her that's (laughs) if she's acting her music Uh is coming uh along with it it's like you can't have a dolly parton movie without dolly parton music company (laughs) and you're really out of hope that's the case because you're gonna bring in those people who want to hear that music yeah yeah that's actually a good point so that was us Sending a lawnmower out into the field to hopefully distract our viewers from the fact that we watched Tremors. <laughs> if you'd like, comment, subscribe, give us thumbs up, do things, you know, do the things. fulfill your side of the bargain instead of just consuming, you bunch of hypocrites. What? Just whatever you do, don't don't climb into a tractor tire to, to, to try to save yourself. Yeah, that's a dumb maneuver. I see you. <laughs> At least make it a tire that's being suspended in the air so you can have a fun time before you get eaten. Or before you dehydrate to death. <laughs> you non-subscriber. With a Winchester. With a Winchester. So come back uh, in two weeks where we will follow up our Spooktober festival of spooky movies because this this is the first one we didn't even mention that off the top this is spooktober Ooh. we're in spooktober this boys spooktober, I'm, spooktober. I'm excited I'm, yes. terrified. I'm excited come back in two weeks where we will rewind adam's family the 1991 super version spooky. not not the tv show even though the tv show is very good but this has christopher lloyd so i'm excited so come back in two weeks when we rewind Again. Yeah. Ken. I'm I'm depending on you, Ken. Uh, I can't. I just You son of a bitch. My cr- I mean Ken's just trying to worm his way out of this one though. Whoa! Oh, Dan got ya. Dan got ya. <laughs> Thank you.